All right, great. So this week we're going to be going over basic input and output as well as files and folders in Python. Um, the slides this week were created by one of my teaching assistants, uh, Gaurav Nayak. Uh, huge thanks to Gaurav for the help with that. It, it helped out a lot, you know, to have, um, why did it go to the next slide? It helped out a lot to have, you know, someone helping with creating the materials for this course. Um, Gaurav also uh, helped to uh, write up this course into a book. Um, so I, I don't know if, if any of you might be interested in seeing that, um, but uh, let me know and I can send it to you. Uh, but yeah, big thanks to Gaurav and I will be presenting today. Um, as usual uh, with, with the um, lecture, if you have any questions, please throw the question in the chat. Uh, that helps a lot because I can, I can just, you know, check it out at the end of each slide and answer the questions at a, at a good stopping point uh, instead of interrupting the flow of the lecture. Um, cool, let's dive right in. All right, so input and output or IO, um, you'll often hear it uh, talked about as IO in, in the programming world. Um, but inputs are a way to accept information from the user, whereas the output is to, is, uh, to provide the information back to the user. Uh, inputs and outputs both could uh, be via the command line, user interfaces, or uh, from files. And you know the, the print function, and we've been talking about this like basically since day one, um, that's a classic example of an output in the console. So if we had a file up here and we just put you know print hello world, uh, and you know we have a string as the argument to that print function, um, then when we run that file, we get hello world output to the console. So um, print is the the simplest form of of output that we've that that there really is out there um, for Python. Um, but user input, I know some of you have already uh, looked into this a little bit for some of your assignments, uh, which is really cool. Um, but there's uh, you can you can uh, get input from a user. So input inputs can be accepted from users using the input function in Python. Uh, the input function stops the execution of the code and gives control of the program to the user. Uh, the user is prompted to enter the data using their keyboard. And once the user enters the data, basically hits enter on their keyboard, uh, the control returns to the program and the function uh, input returns the entered data in the form of a string. It's very important. That's why it's highlighted here. It'll always be in the form of a string, uh, which can be processed further or displayed back to the user. Um, so in this particular example down here, we have we are creating a variable called user input. And we're assigning to that variable um, a, a call to the input function. And the input function accepts a parameter. Um, and the parameter is basically what you want displayed to the user. That's what, what do you want output to the user to tell them basically what kind of input you're looking for. So you'll always want to have something, something uh, informative as the, as the value there. You could also you know, print out what you're asking from the user and then, and then um, just do input without an argument. But it, it's built in so that you don't have, it'll save lines of code to just have input and then put the string that you want to tell the user basically what kind of input you're using or looking for. Um, you can put that string inside of the input function. So then uh, here, uh, so we, we create the user input variable, assign it the call to the input function. And then um, after we get that input from the user, we're printing that user input back to the user. Uh, so in this particular case, when you run this code, it'll um, print to the console saying, uh, enter, enter the number, because that's what we put in the input. Um, in the input function. So it's basically saying enter the number um, and then the control at that point in the program will pause. And this 50, you'll notice it's in, uh, it's in green. That's because that was something that was typed in by the user um, and the, pr the program had paused until, until that uh, 50 was entered. And then after they hit enter, the program, uh, the control of the program returned to uh, Python and they uh, ended output and then it print the value that was given to uh, the function. So that's where you get 50 output back to the console. Um, something to call out here is that uh, it's important to store the value in the form, it, the value returned from input. Um, just put it in a variable because otherwise it's, you know, it's kind of pointless to ask the user for some input and then not store that anywhere. Um, so always, always assign your call to input to a variable so that whatever is entered as a result of that call to input will be stored in that variable. Um, and another thing that I'm just going to repeat again, it's going to be in the form of a string. So I know in here, in this example, um, we're asking the user for a number, right? And they enter a number, 50, but in Python, the, the type of this variable, user input, is going to be a string. 
So you need to consider that uh, for for any use cases down the line where you might you know want want um, an actual number from the user. You get that number, and then you want to use that number for mathematical operations or something. You'll need to make sure that you then cast that number to a numerical value. Um, Cool, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat, so I'm just gonna keep moving along. So input from the user uh, continued. The input function always treats the input as a string. Um, is instance is a Python function that checks the data type in argument one against argument two, and it returns a Boolean result. So basically it'll, it, and I'll show an example of it here, but basically when you, when you uh, call the is instance function, the first value is what you wanna check what variable you want to check. And then the second uh, argument is what um, what data type you want to check it against. If it is that data type, it'll return true. Um, if it's not that data type, it'll return false. Um, but then you can also use the type function uh, to find an args, uh, to find an argument's class type. Um, that's another way to go about uh, finding out the type of a particular variable. So this is just to really drive home that this is going to be a string. So we have the same code that we did, that we had on the previous slide. User input. Um, it's assigned the value input. Um, enter the number, and then sorry. Um, so uh, we get user input. We we assign it. So we have the variable user input. We assign it the um, input function where we we're asking the user for a number, and then we're going to print is user input data a string, and then uh, we're going to put and then we're going to use is instance user input stir. This will return true if user input is a string. Um, and it'll return false if user input is not a string. Um, and then we're going to also print the type of the data using the type function with our user input variable. So same thing as what happened on the previous slide. When the user was asked to enter a number, they entered the number 50. But now when we check is user input data type a string, um, this user input uh, or this is instance function is returning true. This is an instance of string. So. The first argument is checked against the second argument to see if the first argument is an instance of the second argument. So if we had instead in this is instance call had a user input and int, this would return false because it's not an integer. Um, it's a string representation of an integer, but it's not an integer itself. So it's data type is a string. And then we can see that down here as well when we uh, print the type of the data using the type function, um, it, it, uh, it, it calls out that the type of the user input variable is of the class string. So it is a string value. Um, so really just trying to drive that point home here because you will run into an issue sooner or later where, where you forget that um, the user input is always received as a string regardless of the value that you've asked for. And, uh, and then you'll try, you know, adding it to another number and then you'll get an argue and then you'll get a error saying like, you know, you can't use the plus operator with a string and an int, things like that. Um, just know, user input is always received as a string, regardless of what you're asking for. So you'd have to like cast it to an int if you want to uh, treat it as an int in your code. Cool, um, still not seeing any questions in the chat, so I'm just gonna keep moving along. But if you have any questions, uh, yeah, please throw them in the chat. Glad to hear that this explains a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those things that uh, it, it's, you know, you can kind of bang your head against the wall when you're first trying to use the user input function um, and, and then it, uh, and it's not working as you expected, but glad that this helps to clarify some things for, for you, Lawrence. All right. All right, so we can also take input from files. So it can, input can be read from a file using the open function. The open function takes two parameters, the file name and the mode. Um, so the first parameter is the file name. Uh, the file name is the path of the file in the system along with the file name and its extension. So that's like, you know, if I had an input file called input.txt and I had that stored in a folder called, um, and I had that stored in a folder that's like, uh, I don't know, my folder, then the, the file name argument would be my folder slash uh, input.txt. And that would be the first argument to the open function. And then the mode, the mode has a few different options of what it could be. So the mode, um, could be R, A, W, or X. So R is for reading the file. Um, it returns an error if the file doesn't exist and R is the default. So if you don't supply the mode argument, it will just automatically assume you're trying to read the file. Um, so the, the mode is an optional parameter, but um, it will default to read mode if you, 
if you uh, don't include the mode parameter. And then A, uh, the A mode is for appending the data into the file and creating the file if it doesn't exist. Um, so if you have a file, if you um, already have a file and you don't want to wipe out the data that's in that file, you just want to add lines to the end of that file, um, that's where you would use uh, A for the mode. Um, or, you know, this will also create the file if it doesn't exist. So if, if you're not sure if it exists, um, this will this will take care of it. You don't have to handle like, does the file exist? In that case, then do the append mode, otherwise do the create. Um, it's a nice thing about uh, certain methods in Python, it'll just create it on its own. Um, w is for writing into a file. Um, the, the thing to call out here though with W that, um, I mean, that uh, yeah, is really important is a W argument will overwrite the entire file. So if you already have a file, say input dot, um, or output.txt, and in that file you have um, in that file you have a bunch of data already that's valuable to you, um, and then you use the W mode on that file. It's going to wipe out everything that's in that file and then put in uh, your own your own new data. Um, so if you want to add lines to a file, use the append mode or the A for the mode. Um, and if you want to overwrite a file entirely, use the W mode. Um, Cool. Yeah. And the W mode is only like if you don't care that the file oh, about the data that's in the file, like if it's a temporary storage location kind of thing and you overwrite it on each execution of your program. Um, yeah. And then X, uh, the X mode is just for creating the file. Um, and it's a way to check basically like if the file already exists in a way, um, this in conjunction with error handling, um, because it'll return an error if the file does already exist. Um, but the X mode will just create the file. Um, and then yeah, and then return an error if it already exists. So that's that's a that, that one can be useful if you have a use case where you need to make sure the file is there, um, but you don't necessarily need to read, append, or write to it in that particular instance. You just want to make sure the file is there and try to create it. Um, then you can use the X mode in that particular case, and especially like you know if you if it also is important to know if the file doesn't exist, um, the X mode will be helpful there because it will tell you. Um, so it's important to know if the file already exists, sorry, because it'll the X mode will tell you if the file does already exist. Cool. Um, looks like we have a couple uh, questions in the chat. So um, the first one is what's the use of is instance? So it looks like this is based on the previous slide. Um, so the, for the previous slide is instance um, is used to determine if a particular variable is or if a particular piece of data is an instance of a particular class. So I don't want to get too much into exactly what instantiation is right now, um, because we'll get to that when we talk about um, classes down the line. Um, but for now, basically, it's just like you can you can think of every every object, every data type, every variable, everything in Python is a class in some way or another. And that class inherits from other classes in a lot of cases. And the is instance will tell you if a particular um, data, if a particular piece of data is of the same, uh, is is the is the same type as a particular class. Um, so in this particular case, we're checking if user data is a string, or user input is a string, um, and we're using just the stir here because that's the the built-in function for Python, uh, for strings in Python. So when we do is instance user input and stir. Uh, we're checking is user input a string, basically. That's what we're asking here. Um, and, and another way you can read it when you see functions like this, is, it's like, is user input an instance of a string? Um, that's, off, that's often how uh, functions are created to make it kind of readable like that. Um, but yeah, so this is just checking is user input an instance of a string. A use for that um, could be like, you know, you need to make sure that this particular piece of data is a string. And if it's not, then you need to do certain operations on it, right? Um, so, so say like, it, it's, it, I guess it's a little easier to use the example of an int. So say you need to make sure a piece of uh, data is an int because you're about to do some mathematical operations on it. And you can use the is, in, is instance function to say like is instance, my data, whatever it might be, uh, an int would be your second argument. And then that'll confirm, that'll return true if it is, and it'll return false if it's not. And that'll allow you in a conditional like in an if statement to operate on that data as needed. So if it's not a string, if it's not an int, then you can cast it to an int. Um, and if 
And you know, if it is, if it isn't, then you can just proceed with whatever other uh, code you have um, to operate on that particular piece of data. And that kind of segues into the next um, question, which is uh, how would we cast um, an int to a string? So the way you do that is with the built-in string function, the built-in stir function here. So you would, if we do stir, you know, um, stir can be a function. It can also just be a class itself without the parentheses. It's just like the, the a call to the class, a reference to the class with the parentheses. It's a call to the function stir. Um, so if you do stir and then you have your parentheses and within those parentheses, you put an integer in there, um, it'll return that integer as a string. It'll, that's how it casts it to a string. And the same thing goes for the other way around, right? If you have a string, like in this particular case where 50 was entered as a string, if you now need it to be an integer, you can say like, you know, um, int is the built-in function for integers. So you have int and then your parentheses. And within those parentheses, you add the, um, the, the, the variable that's holding this number, which in this case would be user input. So you could do int user input, and that'll return the user input as an integer. Something to call out there is like, so when you go from any, almost any data type to a string, that works, no problem um, in, in most cases. But with integers, that's not gonna be the case. <laughs> when you're trying to cast from a string to an integer, it actually needs to be a numeric data type in that string. So it needs to be like a string representation of, an, of a numeric value. If it's not, you're gonna get an error. Um, so that's just something to call out. You'll wanna be able to handle those situations um, with like conditionals. Um, yeah, cool. Um, another question. Is it possible to use a third argument in in is instance if possible? What's its use? Um, I'm actually not sure. I'm not sure off the top of my head if is instance um, accepts a third argument. Uh, that's a good question, but I highly um, highly recommend um, just looking it up and seeing what what uh, you know W three schools says. I can just check that real fast here. Yeah, it it only takes two arguments, I believe. Yeah, um, yeah. From what I'm seeing, it, it just takes two arguments, so uh, you can't you can't use a third argument there. But yeah, good question. Some just to try. You know, these are things that you can just uh, try out on on your own. See if it errors out. Says something about like unexpected argument provided things like that. Okay, cool. So we had already gone over this slide. I know there were a number of questions on the previous slide, but I'm not seeing any questions on this particular slide. Maybe there will be more once we start to see some examples of this in future slides. But I'm just going to keep moving along. All right, so input via files, the syntax. Um, so open is generally preceded by the with keyword to handle file operations easily. Um, so the uh, so read lines is a function that creates a list of each line in the file and read will read the entire, entire file and return it as a text, as a, um, as a text object basically, as a giant string. This isn't a good choice if the file is huge. And that's something that's important to call out here. If you have a massive file that's like, you know, a hundred pages long of text, you don't want to read that into a single variable. It's going to create a massive variable in your Python environment and it, it can cause problems for you. If you know that your file is going to be small, then uh, using just the full read command can work um, just fine. But it's generally a little easier to operate on your, on your, um, on your file the data in your file if you use read lines instead. All right, um, so some examples down here. Um, so with, uh, there's the with keyword um, provided before the open. Um, this isn't always the case. It's not an absolute requirement, but it makes things a whole lot easier to operate on files. Basically, something to consider here is whenever you open a file, you need to close it. Um, and if you don't use, if you don't use open with the with keyword, um, you'll have to be explicit about when you close that file. When you use it with the with keyword, then it'll then Python will take care of closing that file for you when you're done using it. Um, so so basically, um, the only time the file will be open is while you're within the code that's indented under this this with here. So we have a with open. Uh, example.txt. So the file we want to open is example is called example.txt, and it's in the same directory that we're currently operating in, in our Python environment. And we pass the mode. The mode here we're passing as R, and if you'll remember from the previous slide, that means we're opening it in read mode, so we can't write anything to this file. We're just reading from it, and we want to open it as file object, file object basically, and that gives us a variable that we can then use within the with 
um, within the with call to reference that particular file that we've now opened. So that's what. So this is now referencing the opened file here. Um, so then we do lines equals file object dot read lines, and then our parentheses because it's a method, um, and we need to um, you know include our parentheses to make a call to that method, and then outside of the with we print the lines and um, and then if we run this particular uh, piece of code we have um, this output to the console that looks like this file had two lines in it and it's uh, and uh, because since we did read lines remember read lines returns a list of each line in the file so in this particular case we're saying I'm the input file line one and then this backslash n character is a new line character um, so that's that's uh, something you'll see if you ever need to create a new line within a within a string you can include the backslash n and that'll create a new line on its own um so typically when you do read lines uh the, the everything except for the last line will contain a backslash n at the end because that's actually how the read lines works it breaks it up by the backslash n's um in a way but yeah so we so this file had two lines i'm the input file line one and then I am the input file line two. So this was the first line. This one was the second line. And it's a list of each line in the file. Um, yeah. So so that's that's how you would use open and use the open function along with the with keyword and how you can use read lines inside of that uh, with open. And um, yeah, and then store that data into a variable. Let's see. It looks like there's a question. How can you check that your file is too big? Um, so that's 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 a great question. Uh, there's there are functions out there that can tell you the size of a file, um, and I believe actually we're going to be going over that in a moment here. Um, so uh, so you can use um, so you, so you can use the size function to see how large your file is. That's one way to do it. Um, but generally, it's just the just this call out here saying not a good choice if the file is huge is like generally. Unless you you have a very good reason to use read instead of read lines, just use read lines <laughs> because uh, read lines is a lot easier to work with. Everything's broken up into a list and all that stuff, um, you know. But you can do what you want. Um, it, it's uh, it's it's as long as your file or as long as your code will handle the use case that you're providing, you can do whatever you want here. It's just one of those things where if you have like, you know your computer doesn't have a lot of ram and then you try to do read on a massive file that could cause issues and it might slow your program down things like that um yeah but yeah you can use the size method we'll we'll go over that in a moment here um so object name to access file is not clear okay yeah so uh i'll just go over this one again so with the with uh keyword i know that might be getting a little confusing it, it's weird to say um we're opening a file as a particular variable name. So what we're doing here is we're basically storing in this variable, this variable file object, we're storing in it the opened file. It's this is this file object now contains a, a file. Um, it, it, a re, it's a reference to the opened file so that we can then operate on that opened file um, using the file object variable. So this is like, uh, it's like with for loops, um, if that if that might be a helpful analogy. You know how with for loops, where you have four, four. Let's say we have a list of fruits. For fruit in list, or for uh, fruit in my list, or whatever, then you use that fruit variable inside of that for loop to reference the individual elements of that list. Um, it's kind of similar to that. It's like we're creating a reference to the opened object, to the uh, to the uh, opened file that we have now. So then we can use that um, variable to operate on that file within our with uh, keyword. I hope that might help to clarify things a little bit. But you can kind of think of it like the like what um, we we do with for loops, where where you have you know for fruit in my list, and it's it gives you a reference to to that thing. Um, that you're that you're opening in this particular case, so it gives you a reference to the file. So then you can do read lines. We do read. Um, if if we didn't open it in read mode, we could do write uh, things like that. Hopefully that that helps a little bit. I'm not seeing any other questions. So I'm going to keep moving along. All right. Uh, input via files write in append mode. So append mode will add the text into an existing file and won't overwrite anything. It can be used on an empty file as well. Write mode will add the text into the existing file and erase everything which was there before. 
So that's one that's very important to call out. That's why I called it out um, earlier. Um, so uh, write mode will overwrite your entire file. Append mode will add, will just add new lines to the file. So here's a, a great like a uh, tree basically of how this works and the differences between them. Um, so we have our original file example.txt. It has, I am the input file line one, I am the input file line two. So it has these two lines in it. Technically it has three because this blank line here, but we're just gonna ignore that for now. Um, act like this blank line isn't there. Um, so if we, so let's go down the append mode path first. So going down the append mode path, we do with open example.txt in append mode with the uh, A here, because remember we use the A as the mode, um, as the uh, mode when we want to open it in append mode. We open that as our file object um, so that we can then reference that file object within our with. Um, so we have file object.write, I am the new line. So in this particular case, it adds new line to the end of the file because we're in append mode. So now the uh, resulting file is I am the input file line one, I am the input file line two, and I am the new line. The I am the new line just is at the end of the file. It's now on line three. It didn't overwrite the first two lines. So that's the result of append. Now let's instead open that file in write mode. So if we take that same exact file, we're starting with the same beginning file here and we're opening it in um, write mode. So we do with open example.txt and then you, we're using our mode of W because that's our write mode. Um, and, um, and we're opening it as our file object so that we can then reference that file object within here. And then in our with, with yeah, in our with, we're, um, we're doing file object.write and we're writing the new line, same new line. It's, this is basically the same code. The only difference between these two uh, pieces of code uh, right here is that this one is in append mode and this one is in write mode. So we're writing, I am the new line here. And this overwrites, when we're in write mode, we overwrite the existing data and write whatever we uh, output there. So we output, I am the new line. And it and this uh, this created, this overwrote everything with which was in the file. It got rid of, I am the input file line one, I am the input file line two, and it just put in, I am the new line. So the write mode will overwrite everything in the file. The append mode will add a new line to the end of the file. Very important to keep these in mind because uh, there are there are different use cases. Like there are times where you want where all you care about is the new thing you're writing to the file, so you want to overwrite everything in the file. And there are times where you just want to append something to the end of the file, like you're keeping a log of things. Um, so choose those wisely um, because that can that can cause problems for you. And there's no it's not like you know a text editor where you can undo. Um, so in Python, if you if you open a file and you open it in write mode accidentally, and you had important information in that file, and then you write something to that file, <clears throat> you can't undo that. So be careful um, with using write mode. Um, append mode will is a little safer, but if it's not what you need, if you don't want to just add a new line to the end of the file or add new lines to the end of the file, then um, you would need to use write mode. Cool, looks like we have a couple questions. Um, so someone's asking about the difference between read and read lines. Yeah, sure. Um, so we'll go back to the previous slide for that one. So, um, read reads the entire file and it returns that entire file as a string of text. So you just get one massive string. I mean, maybe it's not massive. Maybe you have a pretty small file. Um, but it, it reads the entire file as a string, the read lines reads the entire file, but it reads it into, um, it reads it into a list of lines in the file. So like in this case where we use the read lines example, we had that same file with, um, we had that same file with uh, two lines in it. You know, I am the input file line one, I am the input file line two. When we read that file in um, with, with using read lines, it breaks up each line in the file into a different element within our list. But if we do read, this would have just returned as a, a one long string, just I am the input file line one backslash in, I am the input file line two, it would not be in a list. So that's the difference between read and read lines. Hopefully that helps. All right, and another question here, can you use more than one mode? Uh, no, you, 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 can't, uh, you can't use more than one mode in a call to open. Um, you have to just pick one and stick with it. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, pick, pick the mode you need. So something you can do is you can nest these widths and you can open multiple files in different modes. 
um, and all that stuff and, and operate on multiple files in different modes. That's a way, that's a way you can do it. Um, but yeah, you, you have to pick one mode because it needs to know is it, because if like, imagine if you tried to open a file both in append and write mode, like how would you, how would that work? Right. Cause now, now Python doesn't know, wait, do I overwrite the whole file with this new line that you're adding or do I, um, you know, delete, or do I just append the new line to the end of the file? So yeah, cool. Um, what if you want to want to add a new line between two lines? Um, so that's a great question. And, and actually, let me check something. Um, so that, that's a great question. Um, a way you can do that is basically it gets more complicated there. You, you might want to open the file in like in, uh, in write mode. And then you need to like read in the context. You might want to first open the file in read mode, do a read lines operation on that file and then open the file in write mode um, and take that uh, read lines that you had before. And then you insert your new line in between the other uh, two lines um, uh, in that list. And then you write that back to the file and now you've inserted it in the middle. Um, so that's one way you could do it. Cool. I'm not seeing any other questions and let me just check something right real fast. Um, okay, cool. Yeah, and and something else to call out is typically when you uh, when you do when you're opening it in like append or write mode or something like that, you could still read from that file. Um, when you open it in the R mode, that's just read only mode, as opposed to um, read and depend or read and write and all that stuff. All right. Oh, we looks like we have a couple other questions. Go ahead, I paused for a moment. Um, so, what is a practical application of input via files? Um, yeah, great question. So like, you know, oftentimes you have you have a bunch of files that you need to process. Like like maybe maybe one example, we, I don't actually do this, but something I could do and I probably should do is like for our for the Python assignments that that we uh that we have. I could write a program that would open up your that would take your Python file, open it up, read from that file and run and do some various checks on on that file to to like give a grade for for that assignment or something. Um, so that's one way you could do it. Another way is like say someone sends sends an email and you want to process that email somehow. You would you know open the email as like you you could download the email as a text file, open that email using the open function, and then do some processing on that. It's basically like you know whenever you have a file that you don't want to then manually type into your program, you can just open that file and read it in. Um, those are some practical applications of inputs uh, via file. Yeah, there, there's a you'll you'll run into it. Um, you'll run into many more practical applications of it as time goes on. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. And another question is, can you show us at the end of the class? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I can show you some examples of this at the end of the class. Just please remind me. I, you know, we've still got uh, 25 or so minutes left and a good bit of the lecture to go. So if I forget, just please throw something in the chat, like, hey, examples, please. Cool. Um, are we supposed to edit .txt files only or are other file formats supported? Other file formats are supported. You could open, yeah, you can open most any uh, file type with the open function. The only thing to call out there is sometimes the, the format of a file is encoded really weird. Um, so like the, a .txt file, is just raw text. Um, there's nothing special happening there. But if you try to open like a a doc a dot doc file because that's you know like the uh, like a Microsoft Word doc or something, you might get it might look a little different than you're expecting because it has because there are other things that's happening in the background of a dot doc file to add the things like formatting and whatnot that you get from having a nice text editor like that. Um, so oftentimes you'll just be using dot txt files because they're easiest to work with. Um, you don't have to consider these weird encoding things that might come with other file types, but you can read in other file types. So I could like, you could read in like a Python file and, and read that. Um, yeah, you can read in a CSV file, which is, stands for comma separated values. Uh, that's a pretty common use case to read in a CSV file or read in a JSON file. That's another pretty common use case to read in a, a JSON file. Um, and JSON, if you're not familiar, it stands for JSON object notation and it's or JavaScript object notation. And it's basically like a dictionary. It's like a file that is holding a dictionary in it. Um, anyway, don't wanna to dive too deep into that one, but since I mentioned it, I figured I should explain. Um, cool, not seeing any other questions. So we're gonna keep moving along. 
uh, files and folders. Sometimes it's required to read and write into multiple files that are present in a directory or subdirectories. With the current knowledge, we'll write the path of every file and perform the operation for each of them. But what do you do in, the, in case there are hundreds of folders and thousands of files inside of those folders? Uh, Python provides an easy way to iterate the folder and subfolders in a path using the, using the library OS, which is basically like operating system. Um, but yeah, you can use the library OS for this. Uh, we haven't go, gone over packages yet. We'll get to that pretty soon. Um, but uh, for now, what you need to know is just like when you need to use the OS package, you need to import it using import OS um, at the top of your file. Um, yeah, so if you have it in a Python file, generally imports should go at the top of the file. They don't have to, but it's best practice to have them at the top of your file. And, uh, and you'll need to import that before, before uh, you can actually use the OS package. Um, and we're going to dive into some examples of the OS package now. So to iterate all the files and folders in a directory, including subdirectories and subfolders, you can use the os.walk function. Um, so just important to call out here, we are importing OS. Uh, if we didn't, if we left out this import OS, we, you'd see an error that says like import error, module OS, not, it does not exist or something like that. Um, so you need to import it first. So import OS. And now we can iterate over everything in a particular directory using os.walk. So os.walk returns a tuple of values. Um, it, it returns like a, a list of tuples. I think it's like actually a generator of tuples of values. Um, but anyway, uh, the way you can, so, it'll, so the way you can reference the individual items of that tuple is by separating them out into three different uh, variables in our for loop. So here we have like root, which is like the root folder, the folders, um, that's all the folders in the, in the um, particular directory that you're, that, that's in root. And then files are all the files that are in the root directory. Um, so this one, this is probably another one that'll be good to uh, demonstrate at the end um, and just show what os.walk returns. But anyway, um, so in this particular case, uh, we just uh, create this for loop for root folders files in os.walk um, and the and passing into os.walk we're uh, we're passing a root folder in our c drive because uh, this was ran on a windows machine um, so passing in as the uh, argument c slash root folder so it's the top folder that we want to walk over uh, we want to uh, recursively iterate into the uh, subdirectories and subfolders um, yeah and then we're printing the root, we're printing the folders, and we're printing the files. So uh, the first thing is the root path. So on the first iteration of the loop, this all here, the first three lines up here is the first iteration of the loop. So in the first iteration of the loop, we print the root. The root is the root folder that we're currently in. And um, the second thing that we're printing is the folders. So within root folder, we have folder one, folder two, and folder three. And then uh, we're printing the files that are in root folder. And it's an empty list. There are no files in uh, this root folder. So that was the first iteration of the loop. The second iteration of the loop, we dive into the first folder of the first folder that was within uh, the root folder. So now our root directory is um, a root folder slash folder one, because we're now within this folder. Uh, within that folder, uh, the folders there are is a subfolder 1a. And then the files in uh, this uh, folder one directory is file 1a.txt. Um, so there's only one subfolder and one file in there. So this, this is a depth first algorithm. There's, there's uh, some differences with, uh, with algorithms about depth or breadth first. And, and this one dives deep first. So it'll dive all the way into the first, um, the first uh, folders before it'll go back up to the, to the next folders. So, on the third iteration of the loop, we've now we're now diving into subfolder 1a, which is a subfolder within folder one. So we have root folder, folder one, subfolder 1a. Within that, so that's the root that we printed out here. Um, and then the second thing we're printing out is uh, the, the folders within subfolder 1a. There are no folders within subfolder 1a, so it's an empty list, uh, but it contains uh, two files. So when we print the files, uh, we get a list of two files file s1a.txt and file s1b.txt. So now, next iteration of the loop, uh, we go, it, it'll basically come back up here. There were no uh, subfolders here. So uh, we, we have nothing more to dive into. We come up here, we've already dove 
we've already dived into subfolder 1a so and there's no more uh folders in that list so we come back up here uh, we already dived into subfolder one so now we're on the sub uh or folder one now we're on the folder two so on this next iteration of the loop we have our root path is root folder slash folder two so that's the root that was output here and then um when we're printing folders um there are three folders in there so we have subfolder 2a, subfolder 2b, and subfolder 2c. Uh, with, but within folder 2, there are no files. So we get an empty list on the print files. Um, so again, depth first. So now, even though we still have to iterate over folder 3, um, we found some subfolders in folder 2. So now we dive into subfolder 2a. So our root path is now subfolder 2a. Um, and the there are no folders in there. And there are no files in subfolder 2a. So now we come back up here, we see that there's another folder to dive into. So we dive into sub, subfolder 2B. So now we're in subfolder 2B. Within that, there are no folders um, and there are two files, uh, file S2A and file S2B. And then we come back up here, dive into subfolder. Since there are no folders here to dive into, we uh, come back up to here. There's one more subfolder to dive into. We go into subfolder 2C. Uh, within subfolder 2C, there are no folders, there are no files. And now we've exhausted this list, uh, this uh, list of folders of subfolders here. So we go back to the very beginning. There's still one more folder to dive into up here. Uh, so we go to folder three and in folder three, there are no subfolders and there are no files. Um, so I know this is pretty complicated to wrap your head around. This is something that you really just need to try um, because it'll make a lot more sense, but I, I'll, I'll go over a, a quick example of how this works uh, at the end of the lecture today. Um, yeah, I have a feeling there are questions, but I'm not seeing any in the chat. So uh, if you have any, throw them in the chat. Oh, now I see one right when I said that. Spoke too soon. All right. Just like adding a new line of text to a file, is it possible to add or copy the contents of one file onto another file? Yeah, you, you can absolutely do that. Um, there are there are functions in the OS package that make that really easy. Actually, you can like create a copy of a file. You can uh. You can just copy the contents of a file, all that stuff, or you can just open the file, store, do like a read lines or a read operation on that file, store that in a variable, and then you go and open another file, and then you write the contents of that file of the first file that you now have stored in a variable to a, to another file. So, yeah, you can absolutely do that. Um, great question. Cool. Not seeing any others, so keep moving along. All right, so so you can check if a path exists using the OS package. Um, so to check if a path exists or not with OS, use os.path.exists. This will return a Boolean value, a true if the file exists, false if the file doesn't exist. Um, and then to check if a path is to a file and not to a directory, you can use the function os.path.isFile, and that'll return true if it's a file, false if it's not a file. Um, if you want to check if a file is empty with OS, uh, this is this goes back to I, I forget who had the question, but um, this goes back to a, a question that was asked earlier. Uh, you can use os.path.getSize, and os.path.getSize will tell you like the general the and uh, like the uh, exact size in memory of your file. And if it's if it's an empty file, it'll just return zero. But if it has data in it, it'll return a size depending on the size of that file. So, but uh, a common use case for get size is to figure out if the file is empty. So there's a, so we have some examples below where we first checked if the file is available in the path and then check the size to avoid any Python exceptions. Um, so we're importing OS because we have to in one moment while I get some water. All right, um, so we import OS and we uh, add our file path as a variable. So the path to the file that we want to read in is um, it's our C drive, uh, it's a root folder, uh, and then folder one, and then file 1a.txt. So this is the path to the file that we want. Something to really quickly call out here is this R. Um, it's it's saying interpret this as a raw string. The reason that Gaurav had to do this when he was creating this slide is because he's using a Windows machine. And on Windows machines, uh, the way you reference files is using a backslash. If you're on like a Mac, or uh, I believe Linux machines are, are the same, um, you use a forward slash. The backslash in Python is actually how you, it, it's considered an escape character. So it, the way it works is like, say you wanted to include another single quote within this string, um, you can use the backslash to 
not make that single quote close the string. And I'll another thing that I need to show an example of because I'm I'm sure that's a little confusing. But basically, if you're on if you're on a Windows machine, you're going to want to prefix your um, file path uh, with with the R um, here. Otherwise, these backslashes are going to cause issues for you. Another thing that you can do here um, is you could just put double slashes because then you're escaping the escape character. It sounds kind of ridiculous, but it 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 works. So um, yeah. Anyway, I'll 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 try to remember to show an example of this at the end because I'm sure a lot of you are using Windows machines. Um, so that'll be that'll be important. All right. So that and that was just the purpose of the the R prefixing our string there. So if os.path.is file file path and os.path.get size file path is greater than zero, then we're going to print the file is not empty. So first we're checking is it a file in the first place. Um, if it is a file in the first place, then and so typically and this is just goes back to our conditionals. There's an order of operations with our ifs, um, especially when you're using an and here. Uh, when you when you do if blank and blank, the first conditional will be um, evaluated first. If this return if this evaluates to false, then we don't need to evaluate the second part of the conditional because since we're using an and, we know that both had to be true. Um, so since this one's false, there's no reason to evaluate this one down here. So that's why. That's why it's in this specific order. We need to first check, is it a file before we can get the size of that file? So we're first checking, is it a file? And then, and we're checking the size of that file, if it is a file, um, and we're seeing if it's greater than zero. If it is, we're gonna print, the file is not empty. And we have an else block. Um, so if either of these evaluated to false, then we're gonna print either the file path is invalid or the file is empty. And then within that else block, we're nesting another conditional where we're just checking if the file, if os.path.is file, we're checking, we're, we're checking our file path to see if it is a file. If it is a file, if this returns true and it is a file, then we'll print file path is valid and the file is empty because now we know that this part up here was what evaluated the false in our conditional. Um, cool. So running this code. Um, on Gaurav's machine, uh, he it, it returned either the file path is invalid or the file is empty. So so it looks like this conditional up here um, evaluated to false. We're not sure which one of these evaluated to false right now, but the next line says file path is valid and the file is empty. So this part did evaluate to true. The os.path.is file evaluated to true. So the file path is a valid file, um, but this part must have evaluated to false. The size of the file is not greater than zero. So that's how we know that the file uh, is empty. Cool. Um, and let's see, uh, up here for where do we have another another situation here uh, where we're checking just a random path. So here we're checking uh, something just called random path. Then we're checking if the path exists. Um, the path, If the path exists, it'll tell us if that's a legitimate path in our system. Um, so if this is a legitimate path in our system, it'll return true, and then we'll print directory path is correct. Otherwise, we'll print incorrect directory because it's not a legitimate file path. Um, so in this particular case, when Gaurav ran this code, it said incorrect directory, meaning that random path was not a valid path on his machine. Um, it could be that he didn't have a folder or a path or a file named random path, um, or it could also have something to do with that he's using a forward slash instead of a backslash here. Hard, it's hard to say. Um, chances are he just didn't have a random path uh, folder or file. So, but that's how you can use the os.path.exists to see if a particular path exists. And it's a, it can be pretty valuable. Like if you're if you're wondering why you're getting a file not found error, first thing that uh, another thing you can check is does that path even exist? Because then maybe that'll tell you there's a typo in your code that uh, you that you know you're it's not a legitimate file path, and you need to figure out what's wrong with that file path. All right, cool. Looks like there's a question. For the folder, uh, we can create it in our way by using folders one, two, three, slash ABC or whatever we want. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, for the folder, like basically for iterating over folders like we had on the previous slide, um, these folder names were completely arbitrary. Um, they were just used at, for an example. So Gaurav created a, some folders with subfolders and some folder, like a root folder with some subfolders under that and then with um, even further subfolders under those subfolders. That's, yeah, so it's completely arbitrary. You can create them however you want. Um, oftentimes it's gonna be something more like realistic, like 
you know, maybe you're going into your documents folder and then say you have a folder for this coding course. So you go into your coding course folder and then in there you might have all your assignments and all that stuff. Yeah. All right. So how did the Boolean, uh, how is the Boolean compared to a number in the if function? Um, so like greater than zero. So um, in this particular case, it's a great question. I did not realize that there was another thing here. Um, so the, the, that's a great question. So os.path.getSize, this isn't. This doesn't return a, a Boolean value itself. This function will return an integer. So it will return an integer based on the size of the file. So if it's if the file has data in it, it'll return a non-zero integer. If the file is an empty file, it, it'll return a zero integer. But that's why it worked here. So this particular call returns an integer. So that's why it's valid to compare to greater than zero. But this is a Boolean expression. So we're checking, you know, um, os.path.getSize greater than zero, that evaluates to true or false because it's a Boolean expression. But this particular function call, that is a, um, that will return an integer itself. Hopefully that helps to answer things a little bit. Um, cool, yeah, and just another thing to call out, I didn't realize Gaurav had this note here. He is already thinking about it. Uh, see how he how we use the R behind uh, or in front of the file path. R is used to include the backslash in the string. Again, backslashes are escape characters, um, or they they indicate that there's like a special character that you're using, like slash n is a new line. Um, there are other ones out there too. Um, like I think slash R is a return care is a re return character or something. Um, anyway. Uh, the backslash, basically, it means just interpret this as a raw string. Uh, don't do any special things with it. Um, don't in, don't interpret the backslash as an escape character. Um, so one for true and zero for false, you mean? Um, I'm not sure I'm following the question there. If it, I believe this is referring to the, the same previous question about this greater than zero. So this will return the actual size of the file, but it returns it as an integer data type. So this this code right here, if it was on its own, will return, if it's an empty file, it returns zero. If it's a non-empty file, it'll, re it'll return any integer that's non-zero. It will not return a Boolean value. This particular thing will return a, um, will return a number right here. But because we're then chaining that to a Boolean expression by using the greater than operator, so now we're checking if that uh, if the integer returned by os.path.getSize is greater than zero because like now that we're putting it into a Boolean expression, now it'll evaluate to true or false because Boolean expressions always evaluate to true or false. But this function call on its own does not evaluate to true or false. And it, <clears throat> and it can evaluate to um, zero if it's an empty file or any non-zero a number if it's it's a if it's a non-empty file if there's data in it it'll be any non-zero number but it'll depend on how much data is actually in that file um yeah and a great question the size of the file in kilobytes uh no i believe it's bytes it'll return the size of the file in bytes if you want to get kilobytes you can you know divide that um accordingly uh to to get um kilobytes which i think it's like yeah divide by like 1024 or something like that and then you can get kilobytes um, but yeah, great questions. Thanks for the questions. Keep asking them. You know, if you, if you have these questions, chances are somebody else has them. Um, and I and I just missed, you know, calling something out. So yeah, thanks. Keep asking them. They they're all awesome. All right, gonna keep chugging along. I don't see any other new questions. Um, files files and folders replace. So if we want to replace a string with another, and and what if we want to create uh, replace a string with another and create a new file? Use the replace and use replace. Um, open can be used in a single line uh, using the with loop to read and write at the same time. So we start out with this file, example.txt. Um, I am the line one with incorrect spelling of Python. So we accidentally spelled Python wrong here. We forgot the H. Um, I am line two with the same mistake in spelling of Python, but this time in the middle of the, of the string. So how do we solve this particular use case? Well, we can we can use our with um, our with keyword, and we can open multiple files at one time um, in a, in our with. So we're opening example.txt in read mode because we in read only mode because we only want to read from that file. We don't want to edit anything there. We're going to open that as file input object, and then we're going to open 
a correct example.txt in write mode as file output object because we want to write the corrected text to um, correct example.txt. So then within our with, so now while these files are open, basically, uh, we're going to go, we're going to iterate over each line in um, file input object. So we're going to do for line in file input object. Um, the correct line is going to be um, the first line uh, is going to be the line from the file input object. So this is, so on the first iteration of this loop, we're getting this line one here. So we're getting the line, I am the line one with incorrect spelling of Python. Um, so in that particular case, uh, that's, what, that's what line is on the first iteration of our loop. So the corrected line is equal to the line, that line, which again is line one here, uh, dot replace. So we're, we're calling the replace method on that string and we're replacing Python with Python. So now we've corrected the spelling of Python uh, there. So the way replace works is it takes two arguments. The first argument is what is to be replaced. And the second argument is what to replace that with. Um, so if, if for whatever reason, you just wanna delete something from a file, you could just, you can still use replace um, and you can just leave the second thing blank. Um, that's one way to, to do that kind of use case. Um, but yeah, so in this particular case, we wanna update the value, any, any instance of Python with Python. And we're gonna take our file output object and write the corrected line to our output file, which is correct example.txt. Um, cool. And so first iteration of the loop, it replaced this version of, Py of Python with Python. Second iteration of the loop, a uh, line was equal to the second line in the file. And we replaced the Python in that line with, um, with Python and then wrote that to the file. Um, so the replace method, uh, the replace string method, it'll work to replace any instance of a um of a particular string basically it, it 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 doesn't have to be at the end of the line and that's what gorov wanted to call out here it can be in the middle of your string and replace will still work another thing to call out with replace is that you want to be careful not that like you're not accidentally replacing too many things so say that we just wanted to say we were like oh we're missing the h so i can just replace t with th well, that wouldn't actually work because then every single T in our string would be replaced with TH. So we'd end up with I am like T T H E for the and uh, line one with incorrect spelling of Python. And then I am line two and with, and the, that T would be replaced with TH. So then we'd have the W I uh, T H H. And yeah, anyway, so just be careful what you're choosing to replace because if you get, if you do something too small, um, that you're replacing, you might end up replacing other things that you didn't mean to replace. So, yeah. Um, so now the output file, when we open the correct example.txt, after running this code, um, then we get um, these lines, I am line one with incorrect spelling of Python. Of course, it's not incorrect anymore, but we just didn't do anything about incorrect here. So another thing we could have done is use replace to replace incorrect with correct. Um, yeah, and then I am line two with the same mistake in spelling of Python but this time in the middle. Um, and maybe we could have said, you know, we could have replaced with, with, without the same mistake um, in spelling of Python, but this time in the middle. Anyway, what if I want to replace only the first incorrect spelling, incorrect Python spelling, but not the other? Um, great question. Uh, that one you gotta, that'll take a, a little more, more thinking. Um, I don't believe that there's another um, argument that you can pass to replace to do that, but maybe, um, that's that's a pretty uncommon use case to only want to correct the first one, but you know why not? Um, yeah. So okay. Yeah. So that will. So the replace method actually does have a third argument. Um, the third argument is count, and that third argument that it can accept of count is how many instances of the thing do you want to replace? So if you just wanted to replace the first one, then you could add a third or yeah, a third parameter to the call to replace and just put one there. Um, and then that'll replace only the first instance. If you just wanted to replace the first two instances, you can just put two. So I'm gonna call out here is, we're calling this on an individual line though. So since, so this is called on line one first and then on the second iteration of the loop, it's called on line two. So if, if we enter in one as the count for our replace operation, um, then, uh, then we, uh, then it'll still only replace the one py python because there's only one in there. So keep that kind of thing in mind. 
um, another question. Maybe we can say the first row. Yeah, um, if you, yeah, I, I'm loving it. Yeah, you can use the break inside the loop. Yes, that's exactly right. <laughs> great question and great answer, Abraham. Uh, that's, that's awesome. Um, yeah, so that's exactly right. If you wanted to just replace the first line uh, with Python, then yeah, you could put you could put break inside the loop here and it'll break the loop. And you could even put it in a conditional to like, you only wanna replace the first instance of it in the whole file. So you just do a conditional with like, once you've done the replace operation, like checking, you know, has has a replace occurred, then, um, then you break in the case that it finally did replace something. So you don't replace further instances of it in that same file, but yeah, absolutely. Um, great question or great question and great answer uh, to that question. Another thing that you could do is instead of iterating over the individual lines, um, you could read the entire file in one line. So you could do that file dot read. Um, that when we do things like this for line and in, uh, file input object, this is like, it's, it's kind of assuming we did a uh, read lines operation here because <clears throat> that's the default. Uh, but if you just did dot read, then you can do a single call to line dot replace and at, enter one through your count as the third argument here. And it'll just replace the first instance of Python with Python. Um, so that's another way to do it. But yeah, with the code we have here, the way to do it is uh, Abraham's exactly right. Use the break statement inside the loop. So awesome. Love to see that. Cool. Not seeing any other questions. Um, so I'm gonna keep moving along. All right, cool. So uh, we're here are additional resources. Um, so you can go to tutorials point and learn about the different modes of accessing the file and of accessing files and also functions in OS. Um, the split method, um, the split, yeah, split method. It's a method on a, it's a string method. Um, this is something that uh, we're doing a little different this time, um, but we need you to do a little bit of your own research here to understand how split works. Um, so check it out on W3 schools. Um, basically it, it takes a string and it splits it on a particular character into a list. That's how split works. Um, but you're gonna need that for your assignment. Um, so this is kind of like forcing you to go go through the go through the slides and uh, and see um, and see the uh, additional resources because you'll need to learn about split. Um, cool. And then, uh, if you want some practice questions, some file practice questions, uh, you can find those here. All right. So what is stored in the correct line in the last slide? Oh yeah. Let's go back to that real fast. So correct line is, so on the first iteration of the loop, the first line that we are taking is I am line one with incorrect spelling of Python. So that's the line. Now we uh, assign to the correct line variable, we're assigning it line dot replace Python with Python. So we took that line, replaced Python with Python, and then we stored that string in correct line. So correct line now stores this string here, the, the one in the correct example. And then we write that correct line to file object, uh, to our file output object, which is correct example.txt. Then on the next iteration of the loop, correct line will contain um, this line basically here, the, the same line that was in example.txt, but with the correct spelling of Python. Cool. All right. Yeah, and then uh, an, a reminder about examples. I'll show you some examples in a moment here. We got to go over the assignment real fast. So let's do that first. All right. So for the week seven assignment, this one's going to be, this is going to be a challenge. Um, but uh, aside from split, you've got everything you need to know um, for for this, but you know this is kind of priming you for what you what you'll need to do after this course is over. You'll need to be able to look up documentation, read documentation on your own uh, to understand how functions work. So that's what we're going for with this whole split thing. That's why we're that's why I'm not gonna um, talk too much about it or show examples of it because I want you to read documentation, read exa see examples of uh, yourself, and um, get an understanding of how to use something like that. Um, because once this course is over. You'll need to be able to do your own self-study. Um, anyway, so for the assignment, uh, there's a folder named college provided to you. Um, and, I'll, and I'll include it in my typical email of, of the week. Um, so there's a folder named college provided to you. The folder has many subfolders and these folders may or may not have files inside them. The folders inside college um, have the name stream one, stream two, and stream three. These folders have files uh, named as studentdetails.txt, excuse me, and faculty details.txt. 
which contain information for students and faculty respectively, given as, uh, it's given as a CSV, stands for comma separated values. So you have I, ID is the first one. Um, so that's the first thing for the first comma. The enroll year is the thing after the first comma. Um, and then the name is, and then the uh, person's name is the, the value after the second com comma. So that's the structure, the structure of the files uh, that you'll be given. So note, even if the folder has a file inside of it, the file may be empty. So calling that out here, you will need to check that the file is not empty uh, before you try to read from it. So question one, write a program that accepts a file name as user input and create a file inside the college folder if the user writes a valid file name. Um, otherwise, print invalid file name in the console and exit out of the program. Hint, user can press enter instead of writing a file name, and that's a failure condition. Basically, if they don't give you a file name, fail the program <laughs> because we want they need to actually give you a value. So if if you try to get a user input and they don't give you something, you need to you need to like uh, exit the program. And a tip there: use exit zero. That'll terminate the code. Um, exit is just a function that tells you to exit the, the that tells Python to exit the program. And um, when you pass zero, it's using a it's using exit code zero, the, the parameter you pass to exit, it's just the exit code. Um, exit codes are important, but we're not gonna get too much into it right now. Zero is the, the code successfully executed, anything non-zero, the code didn't successfully execute. Um, and each code has different meanings, but anyway. Uh, question two, modify the program in question one to write a header inside the file if the user enters a valid name. So assuming that they gave you a valid uh, file name, we need you to write this header into the file. So this should be the first line in the file. ID, comma, enroll year, comma, name, comma, stream, comma, student, comma, faculty, comma, source file path. So those are that's what you need to write as the first line in the file, uh, assuming they gave you a valid file name. Now for question three, write a program to iterate through all the folders inside of the college folder and read the data from the files and write inside the file created in question two. So now you need to um, read from the files in the, your college directory, which will be provided um, uh, with the assignment details. And, um, and then you need to iterate over that college directory. Uh, hint, os.walk is gonna help you with this. Um, so you're going to iterate over that file or over that directory and check all the files and you're going to um, read the data from those files and then write that data to your um, output file that was created in question two. Um, so we're going to, so what you need to write is going to be the ID, the enroll year and the name of the person from the input file. And then uh, those things are given to you in the college directory. So those will be included in the college directory. Um, but, what you, but what isn't included in the college directory is the stream name, the, whether or not they're a student, whether or not they're a faculty member, and the source file path. Those things you're going to have to build yourself. So stream is the name of the subfolder. So did it come from stream one, stream two, or stream three? That's what we're looking for there. Um, for student, if the data is inside the student details.txt file, write yes for student and no for faculty. Um, for faculty, same thing as for student, but the other way around. If the file, if the file name where the data came from uh, is faculty details.txt, write no for student and yes for faculty. Um, and then the source, the source file path is the full path of the file from where the data is being read. So that's like um, how where that file was in, in the college directory. So the expected output will ultimately be, um, so you have that first line, ID, enroll year, name, stream, student, faculty, source file path. And then um, what's your, and then uh, as you iterate over that college directory, you're gonna get these values. So like ID one, enroll year 1875, uh, their name is faculty one, that was received from the subdirectory stream one. Um, they are not a student because it must have come from a faculty details.txt file. They are faculty because it came from a faculty details.txt file. And this is the path that we found that file in college slash stream one slash faculty details.txt. So that's how you're going to put it all together. These should all be comma separated. Um, so you're going to need to like, you know, concatenate everything together uh, with commas there. Um, but this is this is the expected output. So if you're if your, prog if your program is um, creating a file that has this uh, data in it, 
then you're on the right track. Just don't don't hard code it just to create a file that looks like this. That's not going to be an acceptable uh, answer or an acceptable um, passing grade for the assignment. Uh, you need to actually, you know, if I if I go in and I change something about the college directory, then um, that needs to be reflected uh, in your code or needs to be reflected in the output file uh, by your code because your code should handle that. So you may need to learn the split function in Python. I'm not gonna go over the split function any more than I've already talked about it um, because I want you to take some time to read about this split function. You know, we're getting, that we're already on week seven. Um, we're getting pretty close to the end of the course. You're gonna need to be able to do some self-study for all this stuff to figure out, um, to, to like learn about other things in Python. So trying to get you prepped for that by having you look up a, a, a function split and how to use it. Um, and we we provided the link in the uh, slides for the week. Cool. Um, each question in, in a separate file or in one py file. So really, really just one file. Um, the way that uh, this is written is like question one is just like that's the first part of your of the assignment, and then question two builds on that, and then question three continues to build on that. Um, What's most important here is really question two and three. Um, question like question one is it's valuable, absolutely. But uh, the hardest parts are going to be uh, question two and especially question three. Um, but yeah, it's this is just building on the uh, on the file. This it's it's kind of like one massive question. It's just broken up into consumable pieces, I guess, where you can just work on one thing at a time. Uh, but yeah, great question. All right, um, not seeing any other questions, but I did promise I would show some examples. So let me do that. All right, so let me just go through the slides to see what is good to uh, review here. Um, and if there's anything in particular you'd like to see, throw it in the chat and I can demo that. The only thing I won't, give an example of his split because that part of part of what we want to see is that you're you know going to take the time to go read that documentation yourself um if you have questions on it after you read the documentation feel free to email um but anyway all right so is instance what and casting was something that i know someone had a question about so um is instance is built in to uh python so if i do is instance um, and I want to see is 10 an instance of a stir. It's not because 10 is an integer. It's not a string. So that returns false. Uh, but if I was checking if it was an int, that'll work. It returns true. What is it a float? It's not. So remember floats have a decimal. Um, so, but if I did 10.0, oops, <laughs> not O and not comma, man. All right. That'll return true, but now um, the uh, int would return false because it's no longer an int. Um, how about if I did um, 10 as a string? So if I make this a string here and check if it's an int, that's false. It's a string representation of an int, but it's not an int itself. It's, it's still a string, um, but I can cast this to an int using the built-in int function. Oops, and now it's true, so that works. But what if I what if I tried casting a string that was hello world to an int? We get an error because it's not a number. So your string has to be a uh, the string given would have to be like an actual string representation of a number. Otherwise, you're going to get an error. Um, let's see. Uh, what else? So you can't cast it to an int. You can't cast 10.0 to an int um, when it's a string um, because it's not a base 10 number. But we could have, we could have done float. We could cast that to a float. That'll work. Now it's a float. And we can use its is instance to verify that. Um, so let's just, oops. Hey, that does that. 
There we go. So not a float, but if we cast it to a float, now it's true. So that's his instance in a, in a nutshell, a few different examples of it. Hopefully that was helpful. Um, let's see what else. Um, yeah, this already showed the example of how user input is always a um, string, but we, we could use casting. So if I, if I did something like uh, data equals input, input a number 10, and then I do type of data. That's a string, but now, but I could cast it. So I could say int data equals int data. Now, if I do type of my int data, now it's an int. So if you, that's how you can, you know, take user input, that is a number and then cast it to an int. And then, then I can do mathematical operations on it. So like I could say int data plus 20, and that gives 30 because int data is an integer, it'll work. But if I try just data plus 20, I get an error because we can't concatenate a, an int to a string. Yeah, because um, it'll, it'll go based off of what the first data type was, the first variable's data type, first variable's data type in this case was a string. So it's assuming that my plus is a concatenation operator, but I can't cat, concatenate an int to a string. I would have to cast that to a string for it to work. So I could do something like this which you, you might remember from like the first or second assignment. Yeah, now it's, now it's a string. So anyway, cool. So that's his instance and type and some input examples. Um, all right, uh, input via files. We went over all these. Um, I don't know if there's anything. Let me, let me look back over the. Okay, cool. Okay. Um, so the next thing that I think would be useful to demo is the difference between read and read lines. Um, so let me create a file real fast. New file. Temp.txt. And within temp.txt, I'm going to say hello world. It's a nice day today. Cool. So that's our file, temp.txt. Now I can do with open, um, with open temp.txt. Oops, I need to pass it as a string. Temp.txt. .txt. Um, opening it in read mode. And as a file, I'm gonna do input file. Um, then I can do, so if I do read equals um, input file dot read, and then read lines equals input file dot read lines. Oop, what did I do wrong? What did I do wrong here? Did I spell, oh, uh, there's no underscore. That's what it is. <laughs> One of those things. All right, so no underscore. That's, there we go. Now, read is the entire file. So it's not in a list, but if I do read lines, Oh, okay. So another that's another thing. That's another valuable thing to call out. When when you do read, that will read the file and now there's nothing more to read. So I actually need to come up and remove this line. I'll just comment it out. Now if I oops. Now if I do this, now read lines is a list. So that's the difference between read and read lines. So be careful with um read, it exhausts like the whole file immediately. Um yeah. Cool. Hopefully that was helpful. I'm just going through the previous questions to see what else. Um, 
So what if we want a new line between two lines? Um, yeah, I can show an example of that. So um, let's see. Okay, so I actually already have read lines as this. So now I can, so I already read in the lines. So first I wanna read in the existing lines and I wanna add a new line in between the two. So now what I can do is I will do my width open again um, for temp.txt. This time I'm gonna open it in write mode because I wanna overwrite the whole file as f. I'm just gonna do as f because it's faster. Um, so now I can do f dot. So first what I can do here is I can take uh, read lines and I can um, read lines. At, I think it's insert. Yeah, insert. And I'm going to add a new line. So backslash n is my new line character at index one because it'll because this is index zero. I want to put it in between the two lines, and then I will do uh, f dot write uh, read lines. And this this gets weird because anyway. Uh, so um, don't worry too much about this. But I'm going to do a dot a um, space empty string dot join um, read lines. So this is what join does is it takes the string, joins it together using whatever I pass in the string here. So I put an empty string, it'll just join the lines. It'll join the list back together as um, into a string basically. And now we're good. Stir object cannot be interpreted as an integer. Let me see. Read lines dot insert. Oh, oops, I, I messed up my insert. My insert, I did um, the index second. There we go. This is what I needed. I need the index first and then the value. That was my bad. Now, let's look at um, temp.txt. Looks like it didn't actually change it. Let me reopen it. That might be the issue. Yeah, I just had to reopen the file. So now that new line has been inserted in the middle. So to answer the question for you know someone who had that earlier, that's a way you can insert a new line in the middle of the file. Um, maybe not the best way to do it, but it's a way to do it. Um, um, cool. So I think that was the thing. Yeah, that was one of the things that was asked to see at the end of the file at the end of the class. So cool. Um, okay, os.walk, that's the next important, the next most important one. So I'm going to create a directory here, folder one. And within that directory, I'm going to create another directory, subfolder one. I'm going to create two, actually. And within the subfolder one, I'm going to create another directory. A and I'll also let's put a file in subfolder one. A. I'll just temp.txt. Um, let's put a file in folder one as well. Cool. Okay. So now we have all these files in here. Um, let's see the uh, os.walk command in action. So I just wanna show you what's gonna be returned by um, just a simple invocation of os.walk. So if I do os.walk um, on folder one, I can spell it, right? So that returns a generator. So it, it, it won't get too much into generators. They're useful, but we don't wanna confuse everyone right now. Um, so it returns a generator, but what I can do is I can cast that to a list so I cast it to a list so you can see it. Cool. So the first, uh, so when we call it, this is what's returned. It's basically a bunch of a generator and it generates tuples. So on the first, so this is a tuple here. This is our first tuple that was given. First tuple shows folder one because that was the root folder we were in. The second element in the tuple um, shows the subfolders that are in folder one. So folder one and folder two. 
Um, and then it shows temp.txt um, as the file in that folder. So that's where this file comes from here. Um, so then it dives into uh, subfolder two for whatever reason that was the order it chose for these. So it dove into subfolder two first. In subfolder two, um, there are no uh, folders and there are no files. So we just so this so that's the tuple we get here. We it shows the root path and then empty um, lists for folders and files. Um, and then it'll come back up and it'll dive into subfolder one. In subfolder one, we have um, you know that's the that's the root at this particular path. And then we have subfolder 1a because subfolder 1 has a subfolder in it. And then it also has temp.txt because it has a file in it. Um, and then it'll dive into subfolder 1a. And subfolder 1a is an empty directory. So we have no folders, no files. So hopefully that kind of helps see what os.walk is doing. Um, so something that's useful with that is um, you can unpack tuples. Um, and, and that's what was happening on, um, let's see. This, uh, this slide, see how it's root folders files, it's called unpacking a tuple. So if I had a tuple, my tuple equals, um, oops, um, say I have uh, one, two, and the string hello. Um, so that's my tuple. If I wanna unpack that tuple into three different variables, I can do like, bar one comma bar two comma bar three equals my my tube is my tube so what's happening here is i'm unpacking that tuple um and i'm taking whatever is at the first part of that tuple and i'm assigning that to bar one whatever is at the second part of that tuple assigning that to bar two whatever is at the third assigning that to bar three so bar one bar two bar three so now they just have the individual values there. That's called unpacking a tuple. Pretty common use case um, in Python. Um, and that's that's exactly what uh, Gaurav was doing here on this slide. He unpacked the tuples that were returned by os.walk and unpacked them into variables called root, folders, and files. So hopefully that helps clarify that slide a little bit. I know this stuff gets really confusing. That's why we're spending so much time on it this week. Um, but hopefully that helps a little bit. All right. Um, oh. The uh, escape character. Um, so if I have a string and I want to say hello world, it's a nice day. See how when I put that, the when I tried to put an apostrophe, it closed my string, which I didn't want. I want it to look more like this. Um, I can use an escape character to escape this back, this uh, single quote, so that it's a continuous string. So that's what the backslash does. It'll escape that here. Um, so now when I print that, when I like uh, have the REPL environment echo that back to me, we don't see that backslash. It just it just escaped the single quote. Um, but if I did want to include that backslash in the, in the string, then I can prefix my string with R. And that means interpreted as a raw string. Now the backslash is in there. And we get this weird behavior here where we have a um, slash escaping our slash. Um, so we have an escape character escaping the escape character is kind of what's happening here. Um, so another way I could have done that without the R is to create the same exact thing that they had up there where I escaped the escape character. So if I escape the escape character, now I have a problem because I'm not escaping my single quote. So I need to add yet another escape character to escape the single quote. This, as you can tell, this can get kind of ridiculous with escape characters, but that's that's how that's how we have to handle it. So now that gives us the same string, um, but obviously it was a little easier to just use R in that case. So that's why I prefixed it with R. Still included my backslash. Um, yeah. Cool. I'm curious here. Yeah, interesting. Something that's it. I was just curious here, like you know, what, what's the behavior when you use the R with a single quote in there where I'm using the backslash as if it's escaping the single quote. Like, so it seems to still escape the single quote, but then when, they out, when it outputs the string, it was actually escaping the backslash. Confusing, right? But interesting, interesting nonetheless. All right. Um, all right, I think that's everything that I wanted to demo today. Um, 
Let me see. Anything I'm missing for the demo section? I'll give it just like a minute for people to type out any things they want to see demoed. I know we're going way over. If you need to drop, don't feel like you have to stick around. All this will be uploaded to YouTube. Well, all right. I'm not seeing any, any partial questions in the chat or any full questions in the chat. So we'll call it for today. Uh, sorry for going so far over. I just wanted to make sure I took the time to explain a lot of these things to you all. Um, but, you know, excellent questions today. Um, if you have any more, feel free to email or ask them on the YouTube video. Um, and yeah, I was really, it was really awesome to see, you know, someone ask a question and someone answer that question with an idea they had in the chat. That was super cool. I love seeing that. Um, so thanks for, thanks for doing that. Thanks for being so collaborative and involved in, in this, uh, in these lectures. Um, it makes it a lot more enjoyable and interesting for me as well. Um, great. Well, I hope you all have an awesome rest of your weekend and a great upcoming week. I won't be here next Saturday or the Saturday after. I will be on vacation, but uh, I believe uh, Raj and Zach will be covering lectures those days. Um, we'll uh, we'll keep you updated on exactly who's going to be covering that, and you'll 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 get an email. So be looking out for an email with uh with a new invite link because they won't be able to use my Zoom link, unfortunately. Um, but anyway, yeah. Thanks everyone. Have a great rest of your weekend and an awesome week. See you in a few weeks. Bye.